want to thank you all for uh, inviting me today. It's really an honor. Uh, like Will said, my name is Representative Pam Powers Hanley from Tucson, and I do have a master's in public health. And that master's in public health is one of the reasons that I ran for office because I don't know about you, but I I moved here in 1981, and many times since 1981, I'd be shouting at the radio, the TV, or the newspaper, or social media, and saying. Why is the Arizona legislature making these bad decisions? What's going on up there? You know, so I thought, well, I am going to run for office. And so that's what I did back in uh, 2015. Uh, because in the public health arena, I think the Arizona legislature often makes short-term decisions to save a buck or make a point, but in the long term, those decisions cost more money and cost lives. And you all can probably relate to that, right? Because you work in public health. And so um, there are many examples. For example, do you remember Jan Brewer's death panels? Remember but back during the recession, they cut 250,000 people or so off of Medicaid to save money. And what happened? people started dying because people on the transplant list all of a sudden lost their care. So here you have a short-term cut which caused ramifications all the way down the line. Another good example is the $80 million that the legislature cut from child care subsidies and health help for families in need. They cut that $80 million and what happened? The foster care system blew up. So our decisions have long-term ramifications for the people of Arizona. We had, with 19,000 kids on foster care, we had a, one of the worst, if not the worst, foster care problems because of these budget cuts. So, you know, what can we do? In the wee hours of May 3rd, 2018, I suggested that we spend $56 million in earmarked child care subsidies from the federal government to fill that $80 million hole that is still empty in child care subsidies because we had the money. We had the money from the federal government. No strings attached. $56 million. It would have helped so many families. It died on a party line vote in the middle of the night with all those Red for Ed teachers watching us and gasping at the decisions we were making. And so a few months later in the summer, somebody told me that one man killed that $56 million. We are the only state that didn't take that subsidy from the federal government. One man was able to do that. And where's the fairness in that? Where's the fairness when one powerful man, can, in his opinion, caused thousands of single mothers and their children to go without child care subsidies and to live in poverty? So how does this promote the common good? In my opinion, it doesn't. So this past summer, I read a book called Envisioning a New World by Unitarian Universalist Minister Rosemary Carnarius. And in it, she says that to, you know, there's a Taoist philosophy that to have a healthy life, you should balance the yin and yang, right? Balance the extremes in your life, and you'll lead a healthy, happier life. So Rosemary Carnarius in her book says to have good government, we should consciously balance the social responsibility, the yin, the, the mother, the earth, with individual liberty, which is the yang, the aggressor, the male. So think about that. It's really a sort of an interesting concept because it takes policy out of whose party do you belong to and what's your opinion and who's right and wrong and puts it into the idea of, of balancing, the, uh, balancing the need and with the cost. So she goes on to point out in her book that our Declaration of Independence was really the first document in history which, quote, an individual's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was proclaimed as divinely ordained, unassailable, and constitutionally guaranteed. This was a big, huge step for the common man. Of course, we know now it was landed man and not everybody else, but still it was a step in the right direction. And so what Carnarius says is that the Constitution then balanced the ascendancy of the individual with humanity's uh, power to self-government. So we have democracy, the voice of the people, is supposed to balance individual rights. And to keep this in balance, the founders of the Constitution added a free press, right? So fast forward to today, what's happened to that democratic utopia? And in my opinion, going back to that book, 
we have individual liberty and social responsibility are out of balance with our laws. So I believe that big money politics, voter suppression, disinformation, and the slow death of the free press have really altered our democracy. And you can see it in the, uh, the subjects, right? And so there are, there's a lot of consensus amongst the people about gun violence prevention, school choice, environmental protection, but often the laws that are passed are not in line with what the majority of the people want. And so it's really no wonder that people are frustrated. People out there after the 26th election said, the system's rigged, it's not working for me. And again, I think that that's because we have an imbalance and far too many of our bills, in fact, it's shocking. It's shocking in the Arizona legislature how many of our bills are to benefit one corporation or one special interest group or maybe just a small group and they discount the needs of the general public. And so let's look at a couple of examples. The Congress has perpetually skirted meaningful gun violence reform, right? And nearly every bill that passes the Arizona legislature expands gun ownership. And, and the Second Amendment, in my opinion, is that is like the epitome of the individual, right? It over, it, the individual right to own a gun is trumping the public's right to safety. Obviously, there are far too many mass shootings. You know, there, there are too many things happening. And, you know, we just had the, uh, the anniversary of the big shooting in Las Vegas at that concert was just, I think, just this week. And so this is tipping the scales. It's tipping the scales toward individualism and away from public health. And in fact, recently there was a study by the CDC that looked at 10,000 homicides of women and found that half, half of those homicides were, she, that woman was shot by her male partner. There's another article that was in the American Journal of Public Health, which is my American Journal of Medicine, sorry, I don't work for the Journal of Public Health, <laughs> the American Journal of Medicine, that looked at gun violence, or actually violent death, in 23 countries. 90% of the women who died a violent death in 23 countries died of a gunshot wound in the United States of America. We, that is a public health crisis as far as I'm concerned. We really need to look at that. The author of the article said that firearms are killing us rather than protecting us. And as a society, we need to balance. We need to balance that individual right to own a gun with the public health and safety. And so this year in the legislature, we tried to do that after the Parkland shooting, the March for Our Lives kids came in even before the Red for Ed wave came to the Capitol. The March for Our Lives kids, they had a die-in in front of Ducey's office while he was tweeting about the Cardinals. And we tried to get together, right? The Democrats, the Republicans, the governor. We tried to come up with some sort of meaningful reform in the state of Arizona, but it was we were just too far apart. One side wanted more school counselors and more intervention early with children or families that might be in trouble, and another side wanted guns in the school. So there was no, con no consensus, and maybe we can do something in 2019 on that issue because I believe that it should be addressed. Another battle is the battle over health insurance reform. And this is another example of imbalance between liberty and social responsibility. Since the early 1900s, there have been special interest groups who have tried to stop health insurance reform successfully in the United States. The Affordable Care Act was a major step forward. It wasn't perfect, it was a major step, but it included uh, dramatically increased coverage, right? It eliminated pre-existing conditions. It eliminated gender-based price discrimination. It eliminated lifetime insurance caps. It mandated basic health health care package based on disease prevention. And it capped health insurance company profits. And it also included taxes and fees mostly on the welfare, mostly on the wealthy to pay for it. So that was an attempted balanced policy, right? You have all those little parts and they all work together to try to bring reform. Unfortunately, as the ACA unfolded and there were little cuts to make it you know, less, uh, less effective and insurance companies started dropping out, we found that it needed reform. Unfortunately, the reforms that were proposed were repeal with no alternative or repeal and replace. And, and so it, it really wasn't going anywhere, because that's not what the people wanted, right? 
Down in Tucson, I organized a health care forum in the fall, in about a year ago, and we brought in people to tell their medical stories. Overwhelmingly, people said they wanted health insurance that was universal, fair, and affordable. They didn't think they were going to get it for free. Yes, it's Tucson. We had a Medicare for all crowd, at least part of them. But a lot of people said, we just want to be able to afford it. And what is this bill that I'm getting long after? You know, so they complained about surprise billing. They complained about balance billing. They compared, complained about network narrowing. And they said, overall, health care was too expensive. The insurance was too expensive. And access was limited. So they weren't happy with what they were getting. But what we see is the industry going not where the people want it to go, right? And so um, what we see is that, uh, as I said, the care uh, or the uh, access to insurance, people who were covered, increased dramatically with the Affordable Care Act. But unfortunately, there's a lot of underinsurance and medical bankruptcy is still a problem because people are buying the insurance they can afford and not the insurance they need. And so, as you all know, being in public health, denying access to affordable care, you know, brings unnecessary, unnecessary disease to the population and premature death. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't do our communities, our state, and our country any good to allow people to live in sickness and in poverty just because of our policies. So, here at home in Arizona, we do have a couple of good examples of balanced health policy that came out of the health committee this year. You know, one of them is the uh, Arizona Opioid Epidemic Act, as was, you know, paid homage to earlier. That was, you know, Democrats and Republicans working with the uh, governor, and they had solid public health policies that were put in that bill. And I'm glad that uh, my seatmate, Dr. Fries, and I were in the team that helped negotiate that because we got good things in that bill. The other one, in my opinion, that also helped promote public health in 2018 was the passage of dental therapy. You know, many people said, oh, well, let's just limit it to the tribal lands. And I said, no, I have an urban district. I have way too many people living in Midtown Tucson with not enough teeth in their mouths, and they could use affordable dental care, you know. So to wrap this up, I think that the legislature can do good work when we work for the good of the people rather than special interest groups. We hear on the news that we are a country divided and social media fuels that narrative, right? We see political stalemates despite the needs of the people. And so the people are saying, why aren't they doing what I want? I voted for this person, why aren't they doing what I want? And I think we have to go back to the, the Taoists. You know, they say, again, to have health and happiness, you have to have balance. And if you don't have balance in your life, you're going to have dis-ease, right? Dis-ease. So my question to you all is, are the anger, the bullying, the hatred, and the violence that we see in our country today, are these a sign of societal dis-ease in our country because there's so much frustration? And so I think that we need to look at this. I think we need to look at Rosemary Carnarius' idea if we had policies that were balanced and fair and we listened to the people, you know, would we have less dis-ease? Would we have more balance in our country? Would we have, you know, more happiness, to sound simplistic in a way? So I think it's worth a try. Instead of looking at policy and who's right and who's wrong, let's see if it's balanced public health policy or balanced overall policy. And as far as I'm concerned, it's worth a try. Thank you.